It's getting to be that time of night where nobody is out on the streets unless they're either up to no good or on their way home. But here you are, standing in the streets of London's East End, shivering from the cold. No respecting young lady would be doing this, but you're not a self-respecting young lady by most people's standards. You're a lady of the night, forced to make a living by selling your body to strange men. It's a dangerous career at the best of times, putting yourself at the mercy of strangers night after night. But now things are more perilous than ever, thanks to the notorious Jack the Ripper, a killer who mutilates the bodies of his victims in gruesome ways. He's responsible for the deaths of at least four other young prostitutes in the area, but still hasn't been caught. Society turns a blind eye when the victims are women like you. And that's when you hear the clunky noise of footsteps behind you. It's that time again. You take a deep breath and brace yourself to turn around and approach him as seductively as you can. Hopefully he's a nice one. But instead of seeing a regular sleazy gentleman looking for some fun, in front of you stands an insane looking figure with a blade in his hand. You try to run, but he's faster and pulls you to the ground, and the last thing you ever see is an ugly face grinning at you maniacally. But who is he? Jack the Ripper was an infamous criminal who went on a murder spree in 1888. His numerous victims were all female prostitutes from the Whitechapel district of London's East End, a poor and crime-ridden area. And he didn't just kill his victims, he mutilated their bodies, removed their internal organs, and left them behind in alleyways. But despite his high profile, little is known about Jack the Ripper, and historians still don't agree on his identity. Although, he sent numerous letters directly to the London Metropolitan Police, taunting them about what he'd do next. They never could figure out who he was, and his killing spree seemed to come to an end before they could find him. The mystery had spurred plenty of speculation. There have been over 500 suspects from all walks of life, but one of the most surprising people implicated is Prince Albert Victor the grandson of Queen Victoria herself, the monarch of England at the time. Could an heir to the throne really be responsible for such heinous crimes? It might sound ridiculous, but if the rumors going around about the prince at the time are true, he may have had some dirty secrets he needed to cover up. The stories about Prince Albert Victor certainly paint him as an interesting character. Some say he struggled in school, was deaf, or had a learning disability. But most juicy of all is the allegation that he was gay which was a pretty big deal back in the 19th century, not least of all because it was illegal. He never married either, but more on that later. In 1889, police closed down a male brothel in London and allegedly discovered one of the clients had a connection to the young prince. There was another strange rumor that he caught syphilis from a prostitute in the West Indies, which brings us to the first theory about Prince Albert being Jack the Ripper. After catching syphilis, the disease was said to spread to his brain and make him insane. Since a prostitute had given him the infection that was ruining his life, he became determined to seek his revenge on all prostitutes in the world, and thus Jack the Ripper was born. Unfortunately, there are two major reasons why this theory probably isn't true. Firstly, there's no evidence he actually did have syphilis or even went to a brothel. Secondly, he wasn't even in London when the Jack the Ripper murders were happening. The royal family kept excellent records of the activities of its members even back then, and the documents prove Albert was traveling outside of London at the time. Of course, they would say that, wouldn't they? But if you're not quite convinced, there's another major theory regarding the involvement of the prince in Jack the Ripper killings. Remember how I said Albert never married? Well, rumor has it he fell in love with a young shop girl by the name of Annie Crook. Knowing his family would never approve of him marrying a commoner like her, they married in secret and even had a child. But one day, the royal family found out. The queen and other major royals were horrified at the scandal and knew they had to go the extra mile to put things right. So they did what any loving family who wanted the best for their child would do. They hired agents to dispose of the wife, the baby, and anyone else who got in the way. One day, agents raided the house of Annie Crook and her daughter. A doctor took Annie to a mental institution and brutalized her to the point where she forgot the whole incident had even taken place. She was certified as insane and locked away forever, but Annie and Albert's daughter, Alice Crook, wasn't with her at the time of the raid. She'd been left with a good friend of her mother who just so happened to be a prostitute. Nobody knew where young Alice Crook was, but the friend who was looking for her decided for some reason that the best thing to do in that situation was to blackmail the government. Stick it to the man, you commoner with zero connections or money. I'm sure the amazing justice system will work in your favor. As a result, the royal authorities took things one step further and killed both the friend herself and her friends in case they decided to try anything. 
Jack the Ripper was simply a clever cover-up to explain the killings to the public. So in this version, Prince Albert wasn't committing the murders himself, he was just directly responsible for everyone else being killed. If you've been keeping up, you're probably wondering what happened to the daughter, Alice Crook. Was she murdered too? No, the doctor, Sir William Gull, took her into his custody and cared for her, so she eventually grew up to live a normal life and lived happily ever after. Oh, no wait, it didn't quite go like that. One day, a man came out claiming to be the grandson of Alice Crook, making him the great-grandson of Prince Albert, and this is where it gets weird. He claimed his grandfather was the doctor who declared Annie Crook as clinically insane. Kinda messed up, but okay. There's some evidence this could plausibly be true. We know Annie Crook was a real woman who ended up getting institutionalized. And a clairvoyant gave a description of Jack the Ripper similar to that of the doctor who played a key role in this all, but that's about it. Let's be honest now, it's not exactly the strongest evidence. Besides, there are some serious reasons to doubt this story. There's no proof the woman murdered actually had any link to Prince Albert Victor. Besides, the man who leaked the story about Alice Crook being his grandmother ended up admitting the whole thing was a hoax later down the line. Well, thank God about that, because it would really be weird if she actually had a child with that creepy doctor. But it raises the question, who was Jack the Ripper? One of the major suspects is a Victorian painter called Walter Sickert. The evidence implicating him is basically his own art. He made some weird stuff, like creepy paintings of women that looked like autopsies of victims, and he even named one of the paintings Jack the Ripper's Bedroom. An American crime novelist became convinced he was the real Jack the Ripper and tried to prove the case. And guess who just so happened to be one of his models? It was only Annie Crook, the supposed romantic interest of Prince Albert Victor himself. This is where things get pretty confusing. But if you thought that was strange enough, wait until you hear the next suspect, Lewis Carroll. Yep, Lewis Carroll, as in the author of Alice in Wonderland and numerous other successful children's books. Why on earth would anyone suspect him? Well, the evidence is certainly a bit of, um, a reach. It seems like someone out there really wanted him to be guilty and managed to find some anagrams in one of his children's books that were claimed to be subliminal messages about Jack the Ripper. And that's it. A few hyperforced anagrams. I think I'll let Lewis off the hook. If you're not quite sold, then here's another suspect, Dr. Thomas Neil Cream. Unlike the other guys, he actually admitted to being Jack the Ripper. Unfortunately, he only uttered his confession when he was a few moments away from death. Dr. Thomas Neil Cream was a physician sentenced to be hanged for an unrelated murder. We don't know much about him, but his executioner claimed that the last words the doctor uttered before dying were a confession that he was Jack the Ripper. Naturally, nobody had a chance to question him on it and there's absolutely zero evidence suggesting that he might have been involved. In fact, he was in prison for the time of all the murders. So was he the mastermind behind Jack the Ripper pulling all the strings behind the prison bars or just the ultimate troll who wanted to inject some mayhem before dying? Our penultimate suspect is Mary Jill the Ripper Percy. That's right, a woman. Here at the Infographic Show, we're not sexist. We know women can kill people too. Another convicted murderer, she was accused of murdering her lover's wife. And why do people suspect her of being Jack the Ripper? Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, as in the author of Sherlock Holmes books, suggested a woman could easily have been Jack the Ripper by pretending that she was a midwife who needed to carry around bloody garments. And I guess Mary fit the bill for him because she was the only convicted female murderer at the time. I mean, I'm not saying it's not true, but… Before you switch off, let me present to you the final suspect, somebody who many people actually suspect is Jack the Ripper, and for good reason, there's some solid evidence to prove it. A man called Aaron Kosminski arrived in England in 1881 after fleeing from Poland. He lived in Mile End Old Town, close to the area where Jack the Ripper carried out his murders. We don't know much about Aaron, but he was one of the key suspects in investigations at the time, and he eventually died in an asylum. He certainly ticks a lot of the boxes for a potential serial killer. But the next part of the story doesn't start until more than one century later when the shawl of one of Jack the Ripper's victims was purchased at an auction in Suffolk in 2007. I'll stop right there because you probably have a lot of questions. How did the shawl turn up in the auction? Well, it turns out that the acting sergeant at the scene of the death did what any trained professional would do when confronted with the only piece of forensic evidence in the entire Jack the Ripper Escalade. He thought his wife would appreciate the gift and he took it back for her. I don't know, maybe it was their wedding anniversary and he hadn't had time to nip to the shop for flowers. As you'd expect, his wife was horrified at the blood-stained shawl and never wore it. 
but still, the item wasn't returned to the police station, instead it was passed through the family for generations, until it eventually showed up in the auction in 2007, and then a man saw it for sale and thought it would make a nice present for his wife. No, just kidding, the guy who won the bidding actually wanted to try and figure out who Jack the Ripper was. He went beast mode and hired his own personal molecular biology expert to help him figure out who the DNA belongs to. Of course, there were no samples of the suspects at the time, so it was never going to be an easy task. But pioneering techniques saw the use of genetic tests on the shawl to match samples to living relatives of the subjects. Three and a half years later, results showed that the DNA of a living relative of Kosminski were on the shawl. Even better, tests studying the appearance of the DNA suggested the killer had brown hair and eyes, and this matched the one reliable witness statement that the police had collected of Jack the Ripper. Well, at least the police managed to do something productive other than steal clothes from murdered women. In the eyes of the armchair detective who bought the shawl, the case had been solved. Prince Albert, Lewis Carroll, and that weird painter weren't Jack the Ripper. Aaron Kosminski was. Some have doubted his claim, saying the shawl had been touched by many people over the years and can't be used as reliable evidence, but all in all, it seems like a fair assumption. The royal family might not have been behind the Jack the Ripper murders, but they're still a strange bunch. If you don't believe me, check out our other videos on why growing up as a British royal sucks and when royal inbreeding went wrong.